Hello, good morning. I'm gonna take a quick shot while you guys settle down. Um, so, so one thing I wanna, before I introduce my boss, uh, which is always my favorite part of the conference, um, I want to emphasize the, the community aspect of, of the News Challenge. Um, we run the News Challenge, uh, it's going to be twice this year, and we would not be able to pull it off were it not for um, the people who raise their hands and come help us read, review, ask questions of, of the, in this instance, the 700 entries. Um, we, this year we had over 30 people either come meet with us in Miami, uh, gather at Mozilla's office in San Francisco, do bi-weekly uh, video chats where we went through entries. And so some of you are in the room who did that. I just wondered if you guys could raise your hands or even stand up for a second. Uh, stand up, you guys. You guys did such a lot of work. Um, so that's just a, it's about a fifth of the, of the community that took part in that for us. Um, so, so thank you. Um, so in introducing Alberto, uh, I, wanted, I thought about the fact that this news challenge question ended up being very broad, right? It was a notion of how might we strengthen the internet for free expression and innovation. And as we wrestled with that question, and I said, Alberto, this feels really open and broad, I'm a little nervous. And I won't say, I won't quote him word for word, but I will say it's really nice to have a boss who doesn't just uh, who's not just comfortable with ambiguity, but embraces it and really does embrace openness and, and jumping into a project and a news challenge when we weren't really sure what we were going to get. Um, so he'll tell you what, what we're going to get. Alberto. The fact is, we don't really know what we're going to get. We know what we're going to fund, and then we'll see what we're going to get. Um, Thanks, John. And uh, and I, I what I want to do is I want to I want to um, uh, announce the winners of this round of the news challenge, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, about open internet and about what's going on uh, at the FCC, and try to enlist uh, some of your good minds um, in in an effort to ensure uh, that the internet the internet stays free and accessible. Um, I'll thank again uh, our, our colleagues at the Media Lab and, and Ethan. As John indicated, when the, when, the content, when the Night News Challenge contest started, when we began to think about it um, nine years ago with uh, Eric Newton and Gary Kebbell, uh, it was a contest to find and support ideas to use digital platforms to deliver news and information to communities. And I remember one of our trustees said, well, can you give us a notion about what you might fund? And I said, no, because if I did, then I'd, I'd be cheating. And the, the fact of the matter is this has to be like a 12-step you know, like program. The first thing you do is you say, my name is Alberto, and I'm an alcoholic. And you say, no, my name is Knight Foundation, and I don't know what we're doing. And you have to say, now, we happen, though, to have some money. Do you happen to have some ideas? And happily... Um, a lot of people in this room did. I'm making light of it, but, but, but it really is serious business. Um, it is serious business about not prescribing and about not saying th these are the things that we, we had an idea when we were talking in the office the other day, we have some money, would you do it? The answer is almost always yes, and that's almost always a bad grant. Um, you need to be able to let you need to be able to let go, and I think that's probably the hardest thing in philanthropy. In the last couple of years, uh, we've moved <coughs> the focus of the contest uh, from a completely open in general uh, to somewhat more uh, focused to networks, to mobile, to open government data, to health data, and of course, uh, this one is on how to strengthen internet for free expression. And as in the past, uh, uh, we welcome the participation of readers, and thank I joined John in thanking them. And I especially want to thank this year uh, Ford Foundation and Mozilla Foundation for their participation, uh, and thank them for their insightful advice, their hard work, and their resources that they uh, applied to, uh, to the contest. It's always better with partners. I think you'll find that the winners, each in their diverse areas, work under the still broad umbrella concept. 
Um, at the end of the day, I suspect that as in the past, the most successful winners are going to be the ones that have found solutions to practical challenges. So I'll announce the winners now, and then I want to come back and I want to and I want to talk a little bit more about what's happening at the FCC with with open internet. And then Michael Manus, my colleague, will um, lead a discussion with uh, with the winners about their projects. So here are the winners. Um, the first one is Check Out the Internet from the New York Public Library, bridging the digital divide by allowing New York residents with limited broadband access to borrow portable Wi-Fi hotspots devices for up to a year. It's half a million dollars, and the project leads are Tony Marks and Jim English. I don't know if they're here. Tony, I know, is here. Congratulations to them. Ah, code 240, ensuring the future of the internet as a diverse, uh, inclusive public resource by opening more pathways for underrepresented, minor underrepresented minorities to top jobs in technology and bolstering professional support networks to sustain their success, $400,000. Laura Weidman Powers is the project lead, Laura. <laughs> Getting it right on rights from the Digital Public Library of America, creating a simplified and more coherent rights structure for content collections from libraries, museums, archives, and other sources, along with best practices that institutions can use safely to make more content available to the public. $300,000, the project leads are Dan Cohn and Emily Gore. Global, global censorship measurement from the Open Technology Institute at New America, working in support of Measurement Lab, a collaboration that hosts a suite of tools for assessing the openness of the internet. Award is $350,000, and the project leads are Ben Scott, Thomas Gideon, and Alan Davidson. Internet to go from the Chicago Public Library offering Chicago residents Wi-Fi hotspots for up to three weeks at a time in addition to one-on-one -on -one digital literacy and skills coaching and access to online tutorials. Uh, the award is $400,000 and the project leads are Brian Bannon, Michelle Frisk, and Andrew Medlar. I suppose the winners, if they're here, they can stand up and wave. If not, we'll still send them the check. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Onlinecensorship.org from Electronic Freedom Foundation, Fr Electronic Frontier Foundation, collecting information about online censorship incidents to explore concerns about censorship and preserve freedom of expression. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the project lead is Jillian York. Ranking Digital Rights from New America Foundation, developing a system for benchmarking and ranking the world's most powerful tech companies on how well they protect the free expression and privacy of users. $300,000, the project lead is Rebecca McKinnon. <laughs> text Secure from Open Whisper Systems, safeguarding mobile text communications through a simple secure messaging application that requires no special knowledge from the user. I'm not sure what that exactly means, to be honest with you. Um, but John will explain it to you later on after the program. The award is $416,000, which is a really strange amount, um, since it's usually rounded to, I'm surprised this wasn't 500, but it's 416,000, and the project lead is Moxie Marlinspike. Who are the gatekeepers from journalism development networks examining the gatekeepers of Eastern Europe's digital infrastructure by analyzing the ownership and connections of internet service providers and cable satellite operators, $200,000 to Paul Radu and Manuela Proteza. And congratulations to all of the winners. Congratulations to all of the winners. That's our, that's our complete list. You will see them. Hear some of them uh, in uh, in a few moments. Um, 
So over the years, we've we've moved the the, the night news challenge from uh, from topic to topic. Um, we haven't yet decided on uh, the topic for um, the topic for the next one. Um, but we think that uh, that the subject of a free and universal web, of a free and accessible internet, uh, is hardly exhausted with one attempt um, on on our part, and that perhaps we should have uh, a repeat um, and maybe uh, a more somehow more focused attention. And I will acknowledge to you that we don't have the answer about even what to call this or how to focus this. Um, and the point of doing this next part here is uh, asking for your help, your assistance, your good uh, thoughts on what would be effective if you had this amount of money to invest in projects to ensure uh, the openness uh, and accessibility of the internet, uh, how would you do it? Right now, the FCC is considering uh, rulemaking that would tier, uh, that could tier uh, the internet. It could allow certain providers who are able to pay to have access to higher speed and quality of internet than to others who cannot. The debate is on as to whether this tiering of access uh, to internet is a necessary byproduct of our economic system and will provide even better services for those who can afford them, or whether this is essentially anti-democratic since internet is the public square and there may be no barriers to citizens to join their public square. If you're rich and connected, you're okay. Uh, if you work for MIT, if you work for Knight Foundation, or if you work for Exxon, you're likely to have the highest speed. That's just a fact. Um, if you're on your own, you may not. If you're, individual, if you're an individual developer, uh, or if the people who use your programs don't have the money, you may not. We started about nine years ago looking for ways to deliver news on digital platforms to everyone in our communities so everyone could be better informed and determine everyone's own interest, to foster engagement in those communities and thereby build an even stronger democracy. We wanted to build networks of emerging, le emerging leaders, such as yourselves, who would champion those informed uh, communities. And frankly, we had a sense of news dissemination, which came from, a new, from our newspaper background, uh, newspaper and television, where the delivery of news and information was assumed to be general, assumed to be cheap, or assumed to be free. It was not in the, in the, um, in the way of thinking of, uh, of cable, which is expensive, or of tiering, which ups the ante even more. So in light of the real world, the hardball politics that's going on in DC, I, I come to think that we were probably extremely naive nine years ago to think that if this thing worked, uh, that we could continue exploring a free and open internet with a free and open internet. Um, I want to read to you a, a fairly long piece from, from uh, Larry Lessig's wonderful review uh, in The New Republic uh, some years ago, uh, critiquing the movie Social Network when it first came out. And I want to read it to you because I thought it was, first of all, I thought it was uh, as good as any review I've ever, a movie review I've ever read. Um, it was as insightful about the movie uh, as it was entertaining to read. But I want to read it to you because his comments about the movie then and about internet are absolutely relevant to where we are um, right now. Remember, this was written as commentary about a movie. Larry Lessig. What is important is Zuck in Zuckerberg's story <clears throat> is not that he's a socially clumsy boy genius, and it's not that he invented an amazing product through hard work and insight that millions love. The history of American entrepreneurism is just that history. Instead, what's important here is that Zuckerberg's genius could be embraced by half a billion people within six years of its first being launched without, and here is the critical bit, asking permission of anyone. The real story is not the invention. It is the platform that makes the invention sing. Zuckerberg didn't invent that platform. He was a hacker, a term of praise, who built for it. He then compares Facebook to 
Nantucket Nectars, which is a, uh, another company that, uh, that a, students of his, I guess, had, had, uh, had developed. And he says, at each step after the first, along the way to giving their customers what they wanted, the founders of Nantucket Nectars had to ask permission from someone. They needed permission from a manufacturer to get into his plant. They needed permission from a distributor to get into her network and permission from stores. You get the idea, and he goes on. They made the slog and succeeded, but many try and that slog and fail. Some for good reasons, sometimes not. Zuckerberg faced no such barrier. For less than $1,000, he could get his idea onto the internet. He needed no permission from the network provider. He needed no clearance from Harvard to offer it to Harvard students, neither with Yale or Princeton or Stanford, nor with every other community he invited in because the platform of the internet is open and free, or in the language of the day, because it is a neutral network, a billion Mark Zuckerbergs have the opportunity to invent for that, pla for that platform, including all of the people in this room. And, th and though there are crucial partners who are essential to bring the product to market, the cost of proving viability on this platform has dropped dramatically. The tragedy of this film is that practically everyone watching it will miss the point. Practically everyone walking out will think they understand genius on the internet, but almost none will have seen the real genius here, and that is the tragedy, because just at the moment when we celebrate the product of these two wonders, Zuckerberg and the internet, working together, policymakers are conspiring for, this is Larry Lessing, I'm, I am a neutral foundation president. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Just as we celebrate the product of these two wonders, working together, policymakers are conspiring ferociously with old world powers to remove the conditions for this success. As network neutrality gets bargained away to add insult to injury by an administration that was elected with the promise to defend it, the opportunities for Zuckerbergs of tomorrow will shrink. And as they do, we will return more to the world where success depends upon permission and privilege and insiders and where fewer turn their souls to inventing the next great idea. Uh, that was several years ago. I, I cannot tell you how much I believe that is relevant uh, today. As a longtime advocate of, uh, of First Amendment freedoms, I, I have a, uh, a, a, I've spent a lifetime uh, believing and working uh, for the right to speak because we are citizens, not because we are given permission to speak or because we bought a license uh, to speak. And I believe we should do everything possible to ensure that the right to speak, the right of expression on internet, is just that, a right, not a license subject to approval. So this night news challenge, as John told you, attracted more than 700 innovative ideas from journalism, policy, research, education fields. Um, and as we go forward, how do we design um, a challenge, a question, perhaps, that will help keep the internet free. Uh, we really do want your advice. How to strengthen the internet to stay open, to stay authentic? How do we do this work at scale? What tools can we build uh, and teach to enable anyone to use the web securely? And in the coming months, we'll do more work uh, and build a stronger internet. We will probably make an announcement about uh, what the um, what the, the the contest will be um, toward the uh, toward the end of the summer, but I really cannot more strongly encourage you to think about this. This should matter to you. This has to matter to you. Um, if you have ideas uh, about this, uh, I want you to send them to me at ai at nightfoundation.org. Um, I promise you we will, we may not do it, but I promise you that we will consider um, your ideas uh, seriously. You might also want to look at this condensed version uh, of the FCC notice um, at, uh, at a site. You've got the, the, um, the Matt, uh, uh, the Dan Schultz and Matt Carroll uh, built uh, this, this uh, over the weekend in the Mozilla Open Web uh, Hackathon. 
Uh, it's a really nice, I just read it this morning, it's a really nice um, summary of the, uh, of the background, the context, the issues. Um, and again, I, I encourage you, if you do read that and have an opinion, uh, I encourage you to speak up and give feedback um, at the, um, I know this sounds real, this looks really inviting, doesn't it? Uh, this, was, this was done by somebody who believes in human-centered design. <laughs> Ethan, what have you been doing? You should go down to the FCC and fix this. Anyhow, this is, you've got to, this is an opportunity, though, uh, quite seriously, an opportunity for everybody in this room uh, to, uh, to have your voice heard. And again, if you have ideas for the contest, uh, I ask you to contact me directly. So that's the end of the pitch. Um, now I want uh, to invite Michael Maness uh, to lead us through a discussion with uh, the winners and also to uh, talk a little bit about, I think you're going to talk a little bit about the winners of the uh, Prototype Fund uh, grants. So, Michael Maness. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Alberto. Um, so we're going to do, I'm Michael Maness. I'm the VP of Journalism and Media Innovation at Knight, and also the official lumberjack at the Knight Foundation. Um, so we're going to do a quick round of talks where we have each of the winners come up. We're going to do a short presentation on it. We're not going to have questions in this, but you'll be able to find them outside, and I hope that you do, especially uh, to engage with a lot of this great work that they're doing. So we're going to go one by one. They're going to come up, do a little lightning round, and we'll go through uh, at that pace. So first up, we have Tony Marks, um, and check out the internet. Tony. Hey, everybody. I'm Tony Marks, I'm the president of the New York Public Library, and you may think I'm in the wrong place. 19th century institution par excellence, trying to transform itself for the 21st century with your help. And I want to say thank you, first off, to Alberto, to John, to Michael, to everyone at the Knight Foundation, uh, and to all the folks who contributed to uh, this project that we're beginning. So we are still a physical library. In fact, we are the largest library system in America. Uh, the public libraries of New York combined have about 40 million physical visits a year. That's more than all the cultural institutions and professional sporting teams in New York combined. And of course, we have to use those facilities as best we can, and people rely on us. A third of New Yorkers rely on us because they can't afford books. A third of New Yorkers rely on us because they don't have computers at home. We are massively increasing our educational programs, and that includes in the arena of computer skills and access. We are on the way to having about 150,000 spots for free basic computer skills training. We're the largest free provider of that training in New York. We're now offering coding instruction uh, particularly in the South Bronx and in Harlem because we are in the poorest neighborhoods and that's an industry, as you're going to hear from colleagues, uh, that needs much more diversity and more talent. Um, so we hope to contribute to that. We're trying to be creative. We're the leading non-university partner with Coursera now so that we can do blended learning in the libraries as well as with Khan Academy. And there's so much more that we can do. When I first got to the library, um, I was uh, disheartened to learn that most of the commercial publishers were not allowing libraries to lend electronic books. I envisioned a future in which a third of New York and people around the country relying on their public libraries to be able to read would simply not have access to books if they chose to read them electronically. So, that seemed like a nightmare scenario. A technology that wants to increase access was going to collapse it. We happily are headquartered where the publishing industry is headquartered. We shamed them. No, sorry, we negotiated with them. Is this up? Anyway, the, um, and, and got the entire commercial publishing industry to let libraries lend licensed electronic books that's now a national opportunity for all libraries. And that's fantastic. And the coding and the computer skills is fantastic. And we said, OK, now we're gain gaining more content. We're working together with the Digital Public Library of America as founding partners of their great work, getting more of our 
amazing collections available. We hope eventually everything online for free, anytime, anywhere. That's the holy grail that we're all, all after. But as we walked through towards that holy grail, we noticed a more immediate threat right at home. So let's see if this works. Whoops. Nope. Wrong way. There we go. Thank you. So immediate threat right at home. Something like 46, so close to 50% of New York City households that have incomes below 35,000 do not have computer access at home. In the city of New York, roughly a third of all households do not have computers or broadband at home. There, in the neighborhood I live in, near Columbia, it's probably 90, 95% saturation. In the South Bronx and Harlem, it's probably closer to 90% of non-access. People can't afford the razor blades, and so they don't even buy the razors. That means we could have all the content in the world and pump it out for free, and people can't get it. It's why people are lining up in the libraries to wait for our computers. It's when we close the libraries during a, in the evening. People are sitting on our stoop to get leaked broadband. That's when a light went off for us. We said, no, we've got to be able to do better than this. Libraries are no longer constrained by walls. Our provision of access should no longer be constrained by walls. So we said, what can we, what can we do? Well, it helps that we are in every neighborhood, including in every poor neighborhood. We said, let's leak purposefully into those neighborhoods. We, fit, we asked ourselves, what's the best technology? You all will know this better than I. Turns out we think MiFi cell hotspots is the way to go, $40 for a little gizmo. And uh, sorry, am I allowed to use that word in this group? The um, $40 for a little gizmo and $10 a month for subscriptions. We tried with 100 uh, to learn as we went. And now, thanks to the Knight Foundation, and we hope another million and a half dollars that uh, we're going to try to find, uh, we'll have 10,000 people or 10,000 households where we will give you this device. We will pay the subscription. We will give it to you in particular if you're involved in one of our education programs. And the New York Public Library will soon have something like 400,000 people in education programs. That in itself is a means test. Because, so we decided that works. We can supplement our educational programs by allowing you to do homework with this by providing you with access at home. We're partnering with Brooklyn and Queens libraries. We're partnering with Kansas and Maine. Kansas and Maine. Because we want to prove that there is a solution to the digital divide that is nationally possible. We want to prove this isn't just about Harlem or the South Bronx or, or the neighborhoods of New York. This is about everyone in America. There is something close to 100 million Americans who do not have what we take for granted, the access to the world of information at your fingertips. You can't even apply for a job without that access at this point. We need to find a way to convince the federal government, our friends at the FCC, Alberto, that, that we can solve the digital divide that libraries can play a role, other institutions, partners can play a role, because there is so much more to do, and it is so essential. If America leaves a third of its population behind, on the wrong side of the digital divide, we simply will not have an economy that works, and we surely will not have a democracy that works. We couldn't be more excited to see how this works. We're going to learn as we go. It's a great partnership, and we'll be happy to report back as we've, as we've learned during this year. So thanks again to my friends from Knight. Thank you, Tony. Um, up next, we have Laura Weidman Powers with Code 2040. Laura. Hi, everyone. I am really excited to be here. Um, I co-founded Code 2040 just over two years ago. We're a young organization, uh, and we really couldn't have achieved 
anything without the supporters, the people who took bets on us to uh, kind of allow us to make this happen. So I'm really grateful tonight uh, for taking this next bet on us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of why, after working in the tech industry, uh, I started Code 2040 um, and a little bit about what we do. So Code 2040 came about because of two major trends. Uh, the first is an economic trend. Uh, today, science, uh, tech, engineering, and math jobs are the fastest growing category of jobs in the US, and 70% of those involve computing. So you've probably heard people say coding is the new literacy. Um, it's really true when it comes to uh, where the open jobs are in this country. And at the rate that we're currently graduating students who are qualified to take these jobs, we'll have one million jobs in tech unfilled by the year 2020. So this is a big opportunity. The second trend is the demographics of the US. Today, 90% of population growth comes from minority communities. The year 2040 is the year when people of color will collectively be the majority in the US. And at that point, 42% of the population will be black or Latino. So this is a new consumer base, and it's also a new workforce when we think about uh, who's going to be filling jobs over the next 5, 10, 25 years. The issue is that this new economy and this new demography are actually quite disconnected. So currently, blacks and Latinos make up uh, nearly 30% of the US population and earn nearly 20% of computer science degrees. Uh, but when it comes to the industry numbers, they're in less than 10% of tech roles, and when you think about who is kind of creating these tools and platforms as we think about a free, open internet, um, when you look at founders of companies in tech, less than 1% of those backed by venture funding are black or Latino. In short, we're leaving talent on the table, so we think about creating this inclusive, free, open, growing innovation economy in the US, and we're missing what will be nearly half the population when we think about who these creators and entrepreneurs are. Um, but just importantly, just as importantly, um, when we think about the impact that tech can have on these communities, there's a pretty big opportunity here as well. Uh, because these jobs that we're talking about um, are not just any jobs, they're actually really great jobs. Uh, so the average salary of a tech worker is more than the median household income of a black family and a Latino family combined, which means that connecting this portion of the population to these open jobs in tech has the opportunity to lift individuals, families, and communities out of poverty and close the wealth and achievement gap in the United States. So at Code2040, uh, we believe this is the future of the tech industry. This is uh, last summer's class of Code2040 fellows. These 18 students, black and Latino computer science students from around the country, uh, came together to spend 10 weeks with us last summer. Uh, they interned at tech companies and went through Code2040's Career Accelerator Fellows Program. Uh, as well. So when you think about uh, kind of the types of work that, that these students are doing, um, creating these platforms, we have students here who worked on um, creating uh, SMS banking platforms for uh, un- and underbanked communities, uh, students who worked on open sourcing parts of the code of their uh, company's code base um, so that more people could access it. Um, really working on a lot of uh, really cool and exciting things during their internship. Uh, and in addition to the internship, they spend a bunch of time with us. Uh, they get mentors, uh, they work um, with uh, coaches, they do company visits and uh, get to explore different facets of the tech sector. Um, we do a hackathon with them where they work on issues around diversity in tech and think about how they can use their skill set to not just uh, kind of kickstart their own career, but turn around and be mentors and role models and create platforms and tools that allow people from all different backgrounds to come together, uh, get on the web, and, uh, and move the internet forward. Um, the uh, night support will help us uh, this summer welcome 27 students to the fellows program from around the country. 
Uh, they are interning at 20 different tech companies in the Bay Area, and they come from 23 different uh, colleges and universities, everywhere from uh, schools like MIT, Carnegie Mellon, to community colleges and uh, state universities um, and colleges from around the country. So we're really excited to welcome them and to see what it is that they're going to accomplish uh, over the course of the summer and then moving forward as we fold them into our network and empower them to help create new solutions and give back. So Code 2040's vision is a diverse, inclusive tech sector. And we believe that we know just the people to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Um, next up, we have Dan Cohn right behind me, gets, getting it right on rights. Here you go, Dan. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's great to be here and um, to be a part of this night news challenge on the open internet. Um, Emily Gore, our director of content and the leader of this project for DPLA, and I are just thrilled to be part of this attempt to strengthen the open internet. And as Ethan said this morning, you know, we are at this anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the web. Um, but I'll just note here for you today that there were actually forms of human expression before the web. Um, I know I just blew your minds right there. Um, it is true, I was a history professor for many years, um, so you can take my word for this. And the web has seen an incredible flourishing of human expression, um, and one of the ways really to enrich it that we envision is by bringing online and bringing openly available all these incredible forms of human expression from the past to intermingle with all the forms that are going on today. You know, these forms include maps, they include uh, photographs, they include artworks, they include manuscripts and diaries, all this wonderful content, and that content in, is held in places like Tony Marx's New York Public Library, these incredible, wonderful, nonprofit institutions that we call libraries, archives, and museums. And the DPLA was founded to partner with these institution as institutions as a digital uh, partner with them to help them bring these materials online to make them broadly accessible. We launched a year ago. We've had a great first year. We brought together over 7 million items from over 1,200 institutions across the United States, and we're still going strong, increasing that number every day. But we ran into a problem in our first year that really is constricting our ability to share our materials openly, allow them to be reused by people across the world. And that is that these 7 million items have 26,000 different right statements attached to them. You need a microscope here to look at some of these right statements that are attached to these items. And that is because there's general confusion around these older materials about their status. If we look at them, we just simply can't use some of the things that we've seen on the open web that have really helped out with open expression, like Creative Commons licenses. Those are available on a very small minority of the contents in America's collections, but just a very small minority. There's, of course, lots of material that's still under copyright, and we work with copyright holders and others to see how we can make that content at least maximally open over time. But this blue area here includes materials that are variously labeled as unrestricted in a kind of vague way, and I'd even add a question mark there, because a lot of smaller institutions in particular really don't know whether their material can be put online in an un unrestricted way. They're looking for some guidance, some best practices from us and others about what they can do with this material. And then there's just a giant blue sea of material that we simply don't know about. A lot of this in the 20th, 20th century, that's sort of orphaned, we can't find the rights holders. We simply don't know what rights to attach to it, so we can make it available to everyone as freely as possible. So this project is really simple. We are going to take these thousands of different rights statements and streamline them into one set of rights that will be comprehensible. You don't need a law degree to figure out if you can reuse these amazing materials from America's libraries, archives, and museums. And we're not just doing it here in America. We're doing it globally. Um, we're trying to provide a way for that school ch child who is working on a report to create, for instance, a collage of openly available materials from Boston. Um, we'd like to see app makers come to our site and be able to reuse this contents from thousands of institutions um, into apps like OpenPix that allow you to do a walking tour wherever you are, uses the GPS signal, shows historical photographs from right around you. Um, and of course, we want to enable 
accounts like Historical Cats, which tweet out adorable pictures of cats from throughout history from our collection. Um, that's a form of human expression. We love you, Internet. Um, it's not Shakespeare, but it is very important for people to find ways to do these sorts of things. As I mentioned, we'll be doing this internationally. We have a terrific partner in our sister project in Europe called Europeana. And to give you some sense of scale, Europeana has identified about 300 million items in Europe that can be digitized and brought online. And they've just gotten to the tip of the iceberg. We have 7 million here in the US that we've brought together. They're at 30 million. They started a few years before we did. But only 9 million items from their collection are currently reusable in the ways that I said. So we're going to work with Europeana to bring this together starting here in 2014. Again, we started in 2013. And if I could end by flipping the timeline around and hopefully inspiring you to get involved with our projects. We look ahead, really, at decades of work. In the United States, we very well may have a billion items from small places, cultural heritage sites, historical collections in rural counties, um, up to large places like New York Public Library that we need to bring online and to assign openly available rights to in the best way we can. DPLA is fanning out across the United States as we speak to partner with more institutions to bring those contents online. And we hope that you'll join us in this project over not just this year, but in the coming years to bring all of these collections together, make them available so that we can have the full range of human expression online for everyone. Thank you. And thank you to the Knight Foundation for their support. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Up next, we have um, Alan Davidson uh, with the Global Censorship Measures. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Alan Davidson with uh, uh, Measurement Lab, or as we like to call it, M-Lab. Uh, good morning. So M-Lab is designed to answer a, uh, a kind of basic question, which is how can we better understand what is happening when our connections to the internet don't work the way we expect them to work? So, uh, for example, a, um, a student here in Boston who's uh, struggling to finish their homework, trying to get access to the DPLA, no doubt, uh, uh, because of a maddeningly slow internet connection. Uh, an activist in Egypt who can't get access to uh, critical election materials in the weeks before an election, a journalist in Pakistan or Turkey or China who can't post videos uh, uh, at politically sensitive moments. These are actually real world examples that we've encountered and uh, they're maddening because we don't know why they're happening necessarily, right? Um, in isolation, it's very difficult to tell what's happening with our internet connections. But what if, we could, uh, what if we could actually collect uh, the data from thousands or even millions of internet users and their experiences? What if we could collect it and start to ask questions like, is this uh, uh, happening because I've been placed in a slow lane uh, by my ISP? Is this happening because uh, I'm, I'm suffering from censorship from my government? Those are the kinds of questions that MLab was designed to answer. So uh, MLab is a crowdsourced uh, platform uh, for collection of this kind of data about internet access. It was started in 2010, and it's designed to basically uh, do two things. One is to let researchers create uh, tests or experiments uh, on a set of servers that, are, that run uh, around the world. And then uh, users, uh, people can come and run these tests on their own internet connections and see what's happening. Uh, uh, the data goes into a public repository uh, that then anybody can take a look at and try to understand uh, what's happening, not just with an individual connection, but at aggregate what's happening within a country, uh, within a city, uh, with, with, with a particular ISP. There are about uh, 150 servers running right now in about 45 different locations around the world, and the, the, the system's already generated 900 terabytes of data, like just a sickeningly huge amount of data, and people are just beginning to uh, learn what we can make from all of that data, or we can learn from all of that data. So uh, let me put up a couple of obligatory uh, kind of geeky slides. Uh, this one is just a quick look at where uh, MLab tests are being run right now. This was from April. We're running about almost a half a million different tests being run each month now, and you can see they're actually happening around the world. Uh, this is this kind of gets starts to see what we can do with some of this data. So the most popular 
test at MLAB is, uh, of course, the network speed test, right? Like, so you can see how fast your internet connection is going. And uh, by looking at this data over time, we can see uh, how different country, the, the different um, uh, kind of, this is, I think, median throughput for different countries uh, over time and you can, or different localities. And you can see, I don't know what was going on with New York this winter, but it was bad. Um, and we can start to ask, okay, now that we can see this phenomenon, how can we investigate and try to understand what's actually happening? Um, the idea is not just to actually sort of be able to create graphs like this, but to actually create some sort of knowledge that's actionable. So uh, let me just actually skip through to this one. This is a great one. Somebody went through and started to uh, use this data to, to ask the question, how neutral is the net in different countries, right? So this is uh, highlights different countries where using MLAB data, we've seen greater throttling or greater congestion of certain kinds of services. And this is sort of a little bit of the tip of the iceberg. Here's actually a, another visualization. I really like this one. It's actually, if we had video, you'd see it's a sort of spinning globe. And you can look at, uh, based on the most recent data coming out of MLAB, where uh, the top throttlers are uh, for a particular set of services. Uh, and this is what we're doing right now, but it really is the tip of the iceberg. Um, so what's the future of MLAB? I, I should just say we are deeply grateful for the support and honored uh, by the Knight Foundation today. And the grant that we have is actually going to allow us to, 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 to look at two of the big challenges that we face uh, in, in expanding MLAB. The first is transitioning it from a platform that's used by honestly, so a lot of sort of uh, geeky open source developers and researchers into a platform that can be used by, uh, by policymakers, by advocates, by journalists uh, in an easy way. This is already beginning to happen. We've seen reports that people have used MLAB data to study censorship in Iran, uh, the, to investigate the latest uh, Comcast Netflix kerfuffle uh, about uh, uh, congestion of Netflix traffic. Uh, but the idea is to make it even easier, and this grant is actually going to be specifically to help us with uh, invest, uh, improving the user experience and our user interface for MLAB. Um, a second thing, and a really big challenge for MLAB, is how to expand the user base. And this is actually something where all of you can help. So uh, no talk at MIT would be complete without a homework assignment. Uh, your homework assignment, your mission should you choose to accept it tonight, is to go visit measurementlab.net and run one of our tests. Uh, try the speed test. It's actually uh, really fun. Try one of the other tests. In doing that, you've added your data to this large collection that can be used by researchers to understand what's happening with the internet. Tell your friends. Uh, it's something we can all do uh, to, to try to help the cause. And I would just say, uh, MLAB has been a labor of love so far by a, a collection of people, both at the Open Technology Institute, where I work, uh, but a community of developers and researchers who really care. And they're motivated by this knowledge that what we've been talking about, that in the next few years, we face a very serious global debate about how much freedom how much openness we're going to have online. Part of it is the debate we're having in the US that Alberto referenced. There's a much, and it cites itself in a much bigger debate globally uh, about these issues. Our hope is that MLAB can shine a light on where we're actually seeing censorship, congestion, throttling right now, and in doing so, help us understand the internet better and inform that really important debate about freedom online. So uh, we're, we're deeply honored. Thank you very much to the Knight Foundation, and thank you all. Go try a test tonight. I mean, there's some easy, actionable impact right there that Susan was talking about this morning. So uh, next up, we have Andrew Medlar uh, with internet to go Good morning. I'm Andrew Medler, and I am Assistant Chief for Technology, Content, and Innovation at Chicago Public Library. And have I got a story for you. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a city of many communities. It was a beautiful city. It was a dynamic, engaged, and connected city. But not all communities were connected equally. And in this city, there was a library. It was a dynamic, engaged, and connected library. It was a library that was concerned with nurturing learning, supporting economic advancement, and strengthening all communities. 
and especially as the largest provider of free internet access for those citizens, it was concerned with how to do that even more and even better. And then, one day, along came a Knight Foundation. <laughs> and this Knight Foundation said, yes, yes, we too care about informed and engaged communities. And we want to help you tell and write your story. And rejoicing ensued. This is a group participation part. This is where you rejoice. Rejoicing ensued. Thank you. Good. Okay. We're in this together. Well, of course, once upon a time is now. And that city is Chicago. And that is a city that, led by Brenna, as we saw earlier, thank you for the setup. Um, is involved with a dynamic technology plan that will accelerate citizens' connectivity and drive the economics of the city and the quality of life for the citizens. And that library is CPL. CPL is in every community in the city of Chicago. It has innovative leadership and a culture of experimentation and embracing of the future. And of course, that night is you. Thank you for being with us and making this possible. Now, here's how together we are going to move forward to write, I think, not a, not a happy ending, but rather a happy beginning for many of the citizens in Chicago. Now, particularly, this will be for those citizens who live in the bright red spots on this map, which is where less than 50% of the residents have consistent and reliable access to the internet. We're going to give them the opportunity to get connected by circulating Wi-Fi hotspots in a program called Internet to Go. And that will increase the citizens' comfort with digital technology and increase the awareness that the internet is relevant to them. Because actually, that's one of the biggest villains in this story, the fact that many of those citizens don't even know or understand why or believe how the internet can actually be relevant to them. Now, this concept of the internet to go is going to build on Chicago Public Library's precedent and tradition of circulating information in many formats and also many tools to support information, such as the fishing poles that we circulate, the free passes to museums and cultural events, and early literacy, literacy backpacks, and most recently, 500 Finch robots donated by Google, which we circulate to increase the ability for kids and adults to learn computer programming programs and skills. And so just like all of these things, with the help of Knight and circulating the Wi-Fi hotspots with a single library card, any Chicagoan will have access to these in their home. We'll begin in January to increase engagement with the internet by rolling out 300 of these hotspots to three branches in targeted communities, communities where we see that low internet use. And then, after just a few months of this pilot, we will double that number. We'll provide targeted digital skills and tutorials in these communities in partnership with the Chicago Public Library Foundation and our Cyber Navigators program. We'll support that skill development with a roadmap to digital proficiency. And what we'll be looking for is an increased ability by the participants, by those checking out these devices, to use these low-cost devices to access the internet themselves and begin to understand and see how it can help them with their personal goals, their career goals, their educational goals, their financial goals, and why it is relevant to them. We'll survey participants, capture staff feedback, explore E-rate solutions to expansion and sustainability, and we will tell this story to others at library and other industry and non-industry events around the world. And that story is going to be one of how we reached 10,000 people in the first year, what worked and what didn't work, and how Together with our Knight Foundation, we proved that libraries are agile and innovative and partners 
in the solution to provide internet access to all citizens of all communities, and that's no fairy tale. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Jillian York. Jillian? Jillian's with um, the online censorship.org. Hi, I'm Jillian York, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I co-founded a couple years ago with a good friend of mine, Ramzi Jabber. Uh, so this project is called OnlineCensorship.org. And what we do is we crowdsource reports, user-generated reports of uh, takedowns and, de and account deactivations on privately owned online platforms. So censorship, but that's something only governments do, is what I hear a lot. Well, in fact, as our conversations increasingly take place in what we think of as the online public sphere, we need to come to the realization that this public sphere is, in fact, owned by private companies, and that these private companies are making the rules. So let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. So Facebook investigating the removal of a, of a post from former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. What did she say? Was it something illegal? Probably not. Um, Flickr taking down an Egyptian blogger's photos after the, the Arab Spring uprising and citing community guidelines violations. We've seen Twitter take down, uh, repeatedly take down accounts belonging to foreign terrorist organizations. Is this against the law? Maybe, maybe not, but they're not transparent about this practice. And then YouTube banning a Tunisian media site from uploading content at all to their platform. And there are many, many more cases like this. And so Rebecca McKinnon, who's here today, has talked about these companies being the sovereigns of cyberspace. They make the rules, it's their world, and we just live in this world. Um, and this is really fundamentally true if you look at the terms of service or community guidelines on these different platforms. Uh, <laughs> they, they really do. Um, so some of them will say, for example, nudity is not allowed, but there are circumstances where we think that death threats are OK. Um, and that's the kind of values that these companies are bringing forward. They're kind of all over the place. So what we came up with is a platform called OnlineCensorship.org that takes reports from our users. Now, we're focusing in the first phase on five popular platforms. That's Google+, Flickr, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And what we want to do is capture these reports. Now, users respond to a series of questions that we're working on it reiterating and designing um, to get the best possible data that we can. We'll ask them to give us screenshots and other evidence, such as correspondence with the companies, to make our data as robust as possible. And that data will contribute to research, analysis, and advocacy. So the project will be assisted by a team of expert and academic advisors. Now, if anyone in this room is really interested in the project, we're looking for more people to add to that. So please come talk to me after. Um, it'll be available in at least eight languages. So hopefully, we can make this spread as far as possible and then add some on uh, as we go. And we'll be enhanced by visualizations from my co-founder Ramsey's team at Visualizing Impact. Now, what do we hope to do with this information? Well, the first thing is we just want to learn about how social media companies are enforcing their terms of use. And then we want to do comparative analyses of how these companies define certain concepts in practice. So hate speech, for example. Most of the online platforms that we use every day ban hate speech. And we may or may not agree with that. But how are they defining it? And what does that look like as they apply it in practice? We want to raise public awareness more generally of corporate limitations on speech. So this is something that I find that the more and more I talk about it, the less people seem to know about this issue. Um, and so increasingly, you know, as we're having these conversations, on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, I want people to be aware of the fact that this is not a free speech zone, so to speak. Um, and finally, we hope to engage with companies on ways in which they can improve their practices, their terms, um, and their processes for dealing with this kind of issue. So that's the project. If you've got any questions for me, my contact info is there, and you can follow the project on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. And up next, we have Re Rebecca McKinnon and with the Ranking Digital Rights. Rebecca. Thanks very much. My name is Rebecca McKinnon. Thank you, Jillian, for the shout out. Uh, I'm with Ranking Digital Rights, and we are going to be putting out a regular ranking of the world's most powerful internet, telecommunications, and other powerful tech companies on criteria related to freedom of expression and privacy. What are they doing to respect and protect their users' rights? And this is very much based on an issue we've been talking about all day, the fact that the relationship between people and their government 
governments and their societies more generally is increasingly mediated by the internet and network mobile devices. And what we're learning, and the reason why this night news challenge exists, is, because, is the recognition that this, might, this isn't automatically going to turn out well. We have to make sure, we actually have to actively work to ensure that the internet evolves in a manner that is compatible with democracy, that was compatible with decentralized innovation, and that is compatible with human rights. We have to work for that. That means that we need to make sure that governments that are regulating and interfering with and surveilling our activities on the internet are held accountable. And we also have to make sure that companies, similarly, who are shaping what you can and cannot do with their platforms and services, that they too are held accountable uh, and that we're putting the right kinds of pressures and incentives on them to, to make them move the technology in the right way. Now, there's actually a number of efforts to benchmark what governments are doing. This is a Freedom House, Freedom on the Net report that they put out every, every year, and they've actually found that internet freedom has been declining over the past three years, and last year it took a particularly deep dive. Not good news. The Web Index, we have someone from the World Wide Web Foundation. Renata, where are you? She's somewhere around here. Uh, anyway, Renata uh, is, is with the World Wide Web Foundation. They put out the Web Index. They're also benchmarking nation states, governments on their performance. Sweden did best last year. The US and the UK, particularly on freedom and openness, did really crappily. Uh, last year, I wonder why. Um, and so, but what about the sovereigns of cyberspace that Jillian just referenced? Um, the the, the uh, platforms and networks that we all depend on, they are shaped by the personal ideologies of their CEOs, by the values of people who run the companies, who are uh, shaping the, the software, shaping the terms of service, the privacy policies, etc. There's no benchmark. How do these folks stack up? not just in the United States, but globally. We, we talked about sort of some global implications earlier today as well. That's what we're trying to do. And we're learning from the experience of a number of other projects that have been ranking companies on other issues behind the brands uh, published by Oxfam is benchmarking the, the human rights impact of food companies around the world. You have the Access to Medi Medicines Index, which is benchmarking companies on whether or not they're actually giving access to life-saving medicines to the people around the world who need it most and have the le least amount of money. Uh, so there's, there's evidence that companies respond to these rankings and actually compete to improve. So we are drawing on those lessons and that experience. We're working with Sustainalytics, which is a global responsible investment research firm that specializes in doing these kinds of rankings and making sure that not only are we providing uh, information to consumers and users, who can make more informed choices about what they want to use, but also informing investors, because we know that CEOs and boards really care about what investors think. And so this will help to provide yet another aspect in our theory of change to incentivize companies to be responsible and accountable. So where are we now? We've, we are getting ready to do a pilot on our methodology. You know, we've been in research and development phase, and another piece of homework for you to add to Alan's homework that he assigned earlier is we put out a draft methodology for public consultation. We would really love your feedback on this. Um, so please co go to our website, rankingdigitalrights.org, check out our methodology, let us know what you think. Are we asking the right questions? Are we doing it in the right way? Um, once we have kind of finalize the methodology. We're going to be doing a pilot on it later this year and then hope to begin implementing the ranking on a regular basis starting 2015. What kinds of things are in our criteria? Are companies carrying out human rights impact assessments? So before a telecommunications company goes into, oh, I don't know, let's say Crimea and does a, does a, does a deal with the government there for internet access, are they carrying out a human rights impact assessment? about you know, what, what their policies and practices are, they, are gonna mean. How transparent are companies being about what they're doing with your data, both in terms of their private processes, but also how they're responding to government requests. Many of you have heard about transparency reporting. We're trying to incentivize that. Terms of service, what are companies doing with their terms of service? Jillian talked about that earlier. Privacy policies, 
you know, you'd be surprised how many companies, big ones around the world, kind of barely have privacy policies. We're trying to incentivize not only existence of them, but, but good ones and, and good practices when it comes to what is in those privacy policies and companies being honest about what they're doing with your data. And security standards. What kinds of security standards are companies implementing if they're thinking about these things at all? Again, trying to incentivize all of these different types of things. You can go to our website, check it out. Another kind of just general request, obviously we're in the research and development phase. We're gonna be launching the ranking next year. We're looking for partners, media partners particularly, to work on data visualizations, of getting this data out, who we're gonna engage with on the activism side to, to make sure that publics are really engaging with this data and making sure that attention is called to it and that change can happen after that. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to talking to all of you further. Thanks. Great. Next up, um, we have Lilia Markham with TechSecure. Lilia? All right, uh, hi everyone, I'm Lilia, and I'm from Open Whisper Systems. Um, today, uh, so Open Whisper Systems makes mobile communication apps like TechSecure that protect your privacy. Not that anyone here needs something like that because I'm sure you all have nothing to hide. But let's just say, you know, for the sake of argument that some of you are journalists and you might occasionally wanna have a private communication with the source. Or maybe you're part of a group of activists who are organizing to protest against the government or a large corporation. You need to be able to communicate freely and openly together, but privately. Or maybe you're just an ordinary citizen and you're interested in reclaiming your right to privacy, resisting pervasive online surveillance, and you decide you want to try this encrypted communications thing that people are talking about nowadays. Unfortunately, the face of online security has not traditionally been a pretty one. In order to even get started with a protocol like OTR or P2P, you're gonna need some 10-page tutorial with screenshots and explanatory text and links to learn more. Uh, maybe if you're really lucky, someone will make you a video and post it online like this one, which was uh, rumored to have been made by Edward Snowden for Glenn Greenwald in order to teach him how to use encrypted email. And it still didn't work. <laughs> um, P2P has failed what we now know as the Greenwald test. So, at Whisper Systems, we don't think it has to be this hard. Uh, in the security community, we know how to protect data. And in the developer community, we know how to make beautiful apps that people want to use every day. And TechSecure is the marriage of those two worlds. It's a secure messaging app that looks and acts uh, almost exactly like the messaging apps and chat apps that you use today. But it adds a layer of security that is almost invisible to the user. Uh, so how does it work? Well, if you send a message uh, through TechSecure to another TechSecure user, whether it's text, pictures, or video, that content is going to be automatically encrypted so that only the intended recipient can read it. Uh, if you send a message to someone who's not a TechSecure user, it's no problem. We'll send it as a normal, unencrypted SMS like you send every day. If and when that person decides to in install TechSecure, all your messages from then, uh, then on forward will be uh, automatically encrypted. Uh, another nice feature is that it saves your SMS usage. If at all possible, uh, the encrypted content will travel over the internet, falling back to SMS as, we need, as needed. Um, you'll see we also support emoji, very important. Um, another feature of TechSecure, which was just added earlier this year, is group chat. So you can make a group that has a name, a picture, and a list of members. Um, all that information is part of the encrypted content, so the server doesn't know who's in the group, what it's for. Uh, and finally, whether your messages were encrypted in flight, they're going to be encrypted at rest on your phone, which means that your messages will not fall into the wrong hands, even if your device does. Okay, so that's the dream, uh, a messaging app that is self-explanatory, but also secure. And we've made a lot of progress on that. Um, we have the Axolotl protocol, which is an open encryption protocol. Anyone is free to build encrypted apps on top of it. It's a collaboration between Moxie Marlinspike and Trevor Perrin, two very well-respected minds in the field of cryptography today. Um, using that protocol, we've developed TextSecure, which you've just seen. It's a secure text and chat app for Android. 
We also have a secure calling app for Android called Redphone. And uh, those apps are out in the wild. They are free and open source. And we have a huge community of contributors who help us iterate and improve on them every day. Uh, but we're not done yet. We haven't quite solved the problem of secure communication for everyone. For one thing, we have no iPhone apps released so far. We are working on them. They're coming along. We expect them to ha be out this year. We're also going to expand to the desktop. We're working on a browser extension so that you're not limited to just using this protocol on your phone. You can use it from your computer. And down the road, we also want to integrate our text and voice apps into a single, unified, secure communication experience that's easy enough for everyone to use every day. To do that, we're going to need a little bit more help, although we do have a lot of open source contributors. Um, we have only a couple full-time developers who are shepherding those changes and contributions into like one app. And that's a full-time job. So we're going to need more help on the development side and on the design side. And this night grant is really going to go directly to that effort and make it possible for us to bring secure communications to everyone in their everyday lives. So thank you very much, Knight Foundation. Um, you want Twitter handles? We've got Twitter handles. And I look forward to talking to any of you more about Tech Secure uh, later in the day and tomorrow. So thank you. Thanks so much. And finally, uh, we have Dan Tapalaga with uh, Who Are the Gatekeepers? Dan. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hello. I will jump right into the story. Okay, we are in Ukraine, it's case number one. Imagine yourself being in uh, Maidan Square and uh, all of a sudden you receive a message on your mobile phone saying the following, dear subscriber, you are registered as a participant in a mass dis disturbance and if you don't leave in five minutes, you will be fined or being arrested. And this is the funny message. It's not a fake, it's very true. Case number two, we are in Turkey now. Imagine yourself again being this time a citizen of Turkey. You are waiting for the next election scheduled to take place in the following month. Every morning you go to the internet, of course, searching for the news. However, on this particular morning, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube, a couple of other websites are all down. What do these pages have in common? The fact that up un until yesterday they have disseminated articles uh, and uh, text criticizing the government. And uh, here we are. And uh, this is not fake, too. This is very real. I know that Susan is already very outraged, but uh, this happened in reality. This is not an uh, exercise of imagination. So what... Uh, do these two cases have, have in common, Ukraine and, uh, and Turkey? Can somebody point, point, point out what do they have in common? What we can observe here? We can observe the emerge of a new series of relevant actors on the ground, internet service providers and uh, telecom companies. We are not used to uh, focus on these uh, particular companies but uh, they started to play together with the uh, politicians, as uh, we can notice. Uh, so uh, I'm coming from uh, Romania. It's a country from Eastern Europe, close to Ukraine, in the middle of Ukraine and, uh, and Turkey. Fortunately, all this um, didn't happen in my country yet. But nonetheless, they can, they can happen anytime. And why is that? Because we don't know the name of uh, uh, internet service providers and telecom owners. I mean, we know the name, but we do not know what connection they have with politicians, what connections they have with organized crime, if they have with corruption and so forth. And this represents exactly the uh, objective of, of our project. We, sorry. We are trying to map the ESP and telecom owners of the region. You see the whole region in Eastern Europe. We, we have Ukraine up there. We have Turkey down. And a whole region in Eastern Europe that could have any time this kind of 
problem. So you are asking probably yourself, why should we take care about all this uh, company? And I will try to summarize a little bit. Because so long they remain unknown in the shadow, they can continue to manipulate and threaten the ordinary citizens. Two, because only by learning about them, we will be able to put pressure on governments and relevant authorities to change the legislation or available regulation where is needed. And C, three, but mostly because we, we should learn about these uh, companies because we are dealing with uh, new actors playing in the ground and with a new phenomenon. And if you want to take control over the situation, I think we, we must first to be able to deeply understand it. I would notice that manipulating and controlling the access to information via traditional uh, instruments, TV station, radio, newspaper, takes time and why not money. Uh, nonetheless, politicians are always rapidly learning the new bad habits and uh, this will spread in the region probably very fast because uh, of this capacity of learning by politicians, of course. Um, and um, uh, they already observe probably that uh, they have the capacity to cut off completely the access to the information or to distribute instant dedicated messages. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's more effective to control over these companies. So um, I must express in, uh, in a final my gratitude for those to, who support the efforts to improve the transparency of private and uh, governmental affairs. Uh, we thank the Knight Foundation for supporting this project on behalf of my colleagues from, from Romania and uh, I want to thank all of you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Great. So um, what if we give a, another round of applause to all the winners? That'd be great. Great set, I think. Um, so we're doing something a little different this year, which is we're also announcing uh, prototype winners for this. So um, we have a prototype fund that we've started at um, Knight Foundation, which has been around for about a year and a half. Um, and we've changed it, we've had several iterations with it. But the notion of the, of the prototype fund is that we give small amounts of money to start or create an early version of your idea. That is uh, $35,000 or less. Shockingly, they're almost all $35,000. Um, but uh, we do it as an, an, a way of recognizing an idea that maybe not have an organization behind it and not fully baked yet. Um, so this is always open. Um, they, uh, we have a deadline of August 1st for the next uh, cohort of these. So if you have an idea that you're thinking about um, and you want to test it out um, and put a version of it out in the world, um, this is a great way to do that. We also, if you're selected as a prototype winner, uh, we do a two-day human-centered design training with the rest of the group to help you engage with consumers and really focus on what the problem is for an audience that you have. So uh, we've actually been moving prototype winners uh, um, out of the news challenge, people who um, submitted to the news challenge, and we moved them prototypes, and we, we're doing that kind of silently. We just, it was a great intake for us around that. So we wanted, though, to recognize, uh, change that up a bit, and recognize that these, we think these ideas are great, um, and that we want to see them start um, iterating on it and building out in the world. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm, what I'm going to do is um, just tell you the uh, idea, the title of the idea, uh, the people involved with it, a little bit about it. And when I call your name, just stand up um, in the audience, and then we'll hold our applause to the end. So we have 10 winners. Um, the first one is the Anti-Censorship Alert System by Center for Rights. This is a series of tools that allows the public to see a blocked website. Um, and the project lead on this is Tiffany Chang, and Evan Greer is here uh, supporting the project. Uh, Breeders by Swell Creative Group, a mobile app that helps parents navigate the technology and online content available for their kids. Uh, the lead on that is Philip Holmes. Um, Certidig by University of Kansas, a, systems, uh, a system that enables secure communications and helps people verify information online. Michael Williams is the lead there. Checkdesk by Midan, Midan, a tool that helps journalists quickly verify the source of information in deadly situations, and that's Tom uh, Trudner. Right there. 
Uh, Inquisit by Whirligig, a tool that helps groups collaborate together on complex research projects, and that's Seth Kaufman and Maria Pazzarotti. Poking the Bear, yay, uh, by Salic Telesystems, a new family of tools that can detect and prove network neutrality violations. The lead on that is Bart Stidham. Uh, report a Troll by Hollaback, a platform where victims can safely report online harassment and volunteers can resp respond. Uh, the project lead on that is uh, Emily May, and uh, Dibjani Roy is here with the project. Uh, safe Travels Online by Tibet Action Institute, resources that help new users learn how to safely navigate the internet. That's Nathan Freitas. Uh, Swarm Eyes by The Guardian Media Group, a tool that allows journalists to conduct research with the help of others. Matt McAllister is the lead on that. And finally, Threshold Future Incorporated, an internet-themed virtual currency that makes it easier for open internet projects to find funding. And the leads on that are Elizabeth Stark and Mike uh, Sofair. So a round of applause for our prototype winners. And if you, I would encourage you, if you want to learn more, uh, seek them out. It's a great uh, thing. Again, August 1st is the deadline, so if you have something that you're thinking about doing, it's open. Um, it, there, there's no theme. This happened to be themed because of the contest, but it's generally any idea that um, impacts uh, media, information, and journalism. Um, with that, uh, we'll end our morning. Thanks for paying such good attention, and we have lunch outside. Thank you so much. <laughs>